Good morning. Welcome to today's webinar on the subject of eStewards version 4. This morning I'm going to highlight the main changes between the previous version of eStewards, which was version 3.1, as we are now auditing to version 4.0. For anyone who hasn't transitioned yet, to give you an idea of what those key changes are and what you can expect for your audit. Um, and if you have transitioned, maybe reinforce uh, some, some of those changes to make sure you have controls in place um, that are adequate to meet those new requirements. There's a lot of information here, so we are just going to do a, a high level review, um, but I have my contact information at the end of the slide in case you have some technical questions and eStewards is also a good resource for any technical questions about the standard. My name is Austin Matthews. I'm the EHS Assistant Program Manager with PJR. I have a brief agenda on this slide as well. We'll talk very briefly about PJR, who we are, what we do, um, some of the benefits to certification such as eStewards. I'll go over the transition timeline information for anyone who isn't already aware. We will cover the key changes at a high level, go through more of a clause by clause overview so you can see where those changes are found in the standard. Um, at the end of the presentation, I will also provide an overview of the certification process. If you are pursuing certification for the first time instead of transitioning from the previous version, what does that process look like? I will close with time for questions, but at any point, if you have questions, please feel free to go ahead and type those into the chat field or the question field, and I will have time for those at the end. Today's presentation is being recorded, and you can access a recording of the webinar on PJR's website sometime in the next day or two. A copy of the slides can also be downloaded from PJR's website within the next day or two. Perry Johnson Registrars is one of the leading registrars in the world. We have clients located around the globe. This is not an all-inclusive list, but certainly gives you an idea of our global presence to be able to certify companies to a wide variety of standards. Obviously, today we're talking about the eSteward standard um, to which we have actually now achieved accreditation. So, some of these slides are a little bit outdated uh, given some recent accreditation developments. I will go ahead and make some tweaks to the slides before we post them to make sure they contain the most up-to-date information. But as you can see, Perry Johnson Registrars is accredited to grant certification for, as I said, a wide variety of standards. <clears throat> eStewards represents a commitment to preventing illegal or irresponsible handling of e-waste streams or related hazardous wastes. It also represents a commitment to data security, protection of data, social responsibility, and environmental protection and, and conservation efforts. Maintaining a certification to the eStewards standard has benefits and drivers associated with, again, maintaining those systems, those certifications, such as reductions in environmental, occupational health and safety, data security, and social accountability risks for the certified organization. There are business management drivers, such as improvements to public image, the ability to advertise the responsible management of those electronics and components, being able to advertise a certification like eStewards can provide a competitive advantage as well over entities that don't hold similar certifications. And the standard, again, represents a framework for not only reducing risk, but also maintaining compliance with applicable requirements. Those might be regulatory requirements or customer requirements or both. An example of a applicable regulatory requirement would be the Basel Convention. eStewards version 4.0 was published 
in February of last year. The standard can be obtained through the eStewards website. Version 4 of the standard is free compared to previous versions of eStewards which were not free. Um, there's also no longer a requirement for an end user agreement with eStewards to obtain a copy of the standard. And the reasons for these changes are that the ISO 14001 language that was proprietary is no longer found within the standard. The deadline to transition is coming up later this year, August 24th, 2021. So on that date, any remaining version 3.1 certificates will be withdrawn. All audits scheduled to begin on or after the beginning of this year do now need to be conducted to version 4.0. This was extended from the original deadline uh, due to COVID. PGR had issued a transition plan focused on eStewards version 4.0 um, that is available on PGR's website as well as having been emailed individually to all of our certified clients at the time. PGR recommends a deadline of June 1st of this year to have your transition audit so that we can guarantee no lapse in certification. The audit needs to take place in advance of the deadline in order to allow for all of our behind the scenes certification decision making activities. Not only does the audit need to take place, but any nonconformities issued at the audit need to be closed through acceptable corrective action responses through the auditor, approved through the auditor. The package itself needs to go through our technical review process. The certificate department then gets the package to issue uh, draft or sample certificates to the client to approve, make sure all the, the information is correct. Any outstanding balances need to be paid before a certificate can be issued. Um, so all of those things need to transpire before the uh, withdrawal date or the overall transition deadline. Otherwise, you'll have a lapse in certification. eStewards version 4 transition audits are allowed to take place during either a surveillance or a recertification audit. That's up to the client's preference and where they fall within their uh, audit cycle when they plan to transition. The eStewards trans transition plan did not require transitions to take place in a certain type of audit. There is the possibility that time will need to be added to your audit to account for all of the transition requirements. This depends on the type of audit um, and the audit time. There is a lot to cover during the transition audit. We are already trans, uh, conducting transition audits. So again, these slides are slightly outdated, but PJR is already auditing to version 4.0. If you haven't already discussed when you'll transition with your scheduler, please do so, so we can make sure um, we get you scheduled and have your transition audit successfully completed uh, before a potential lapse in certification. I put the transition timeline information uh, on this slide. Sometimes a visual representation is helpful. We are pretty far into this process now with no longer conducting version 3.1 audits as of January 1st of this year. So if you haven't transitioned, you will be transitioning at this next audit. <clears throat> Again, our recommendation for an, a deadline to have your audit is June 1st of this year. August 24th is the deadline to transition for eStewards. All remaining version 3.1 certificates will become obsolete on or before that date. I also included a deadline a little further out, but in case anyone missed this in the standard, July 1st of 2022, is the deadline for eStewards version 4 client organizations to obtain NAID AAA data security certification as well. So this is a requirement in the new version of the standard. It's not in effect just yet. Some clients actually already have this certification, but if you don't already have, excuse me, NAID AAA certification, you are required to obtain that by July 1st of 2022. So after you transition, 
to version four, this will probably be the next thing you want to look into and get ready for. At a high level, some of the key changes in version four are as follows. The standard is shorter overall because the 14,001 verbiage has been removed and it's now free. We did talk about that already. Um, it is supposed to be easier to understand this version of the standard, maybe uh, removing some ambiguity using clearer language. This version is also supposed to be less prescriptive overall, providing more flexibility to its clients in certain areas while retaining rigor in the other key areas, um, such as controls for human health, export legality, and data security expectations. Version 4 does incorporate the new Basel Convention trade rules and recent amendments and does require a separate ISO 14001 certification. So this is another key change. Since the 14001 language has been removed, you now have to have a separate certification to still meet that requirement to have 14001 in conjunction with eStewards. There is specified audit time requirements found in Appendix C that the certification bodies such as PJR are required to utilize and clients can expect audit time to increase overall using Appendix C to calculate audit time and maintaining that separate ISO 14001 certification. I already mentioned the requirement to obtain NAID AAA certification by July 1st of 2022. So that is another key change, but I do want to note that eStewards negotiated a reduction of the NAID fees for eStewards certified organizations. So when you pursue NAID AAA, definitely let them know that you are certified to eStewards as well so that you can take advantage of that reduced cost. Another key change is the creation of the guidance document for eStewards. There are an increased number of definitions, some new terms. Version 4 includes extended producer requirements. It has relaxed some inventory requirements for QSCs, qualified smaller components. You can check that out in the definitions section. It allows these items, these particular items that meet the QSC definition, to be put in lots, for example, instead of the need to serialize each individual unit, which is not always possible. But again, take a close look at the definition of that term. Version 4 does allow tolling, but it regulates it through the standard. And there are some additional noise monitoring requirements as well. In some cases, annual sampling is reduced. The outdated battery testing requirements have been made more flexible. On-site downstream audits are decreased to every three years instead of every two years in version 4. There are additional closure plan, financial instrument, and insurance check requirements. And the uh, version 4.0 includes appendices on a variety of subjects at the end of the standard. Um, these include standard implementation, rules for organizations, rules for certification bodies such as PJR, and data security requirements respectively. So those are the four appendices that you can find at the end of the document. We won't be going through the definitions in this presentation. Uh, it's already a lot of information to get through in a short amount of time, but I did want to include them in the slides to direct your attention to those areas. Um, and you can certainly download a copy of these slides to review in more detail as well. Okay, so we covered those key changes at a high level. We're not going to go through every single clause of the standard, but I do want to briefly move through the standard and draw your attention to some areas in the standard um, that contain more significant changes. So you can get a sense of how the standard has been restructured a little bit as well. In clause four, which focuses on the context of the organization, you can find some additional requirements for items to be specifically included in the documented scope in 4.1. 
It also requires the precautionary principle be considered, um, the waste management hierarchy where possible, maintaining transparency, things like that. So there are some things that need to be specifically included and then some things that need to be considered and potentially included by the organization. Many sections of the standard are shortened by the removal of the 14001 language and may have some slight changes, but nothing worth noting as the intent isn't significantly changed and we'll be skipping those areas such as 5.1. In 5.2, you find some additional uh, items to be included in the policy, the documented policy. Five point three requires the establishment of teams for implementing and improving the sustainability, or I'm sorry, the stewardship management system. Excuse me, including a safety team, which is to include representation from all levels of the stewards organization. So some organizations already do this, but now this is explicitly required within the standard. Again, found in five point three. actions and risks ask addressing risks and opportunities 6.1 requires planning and documenting specific tasks to be utilized in addressing and monitoring those risks and opportunities so you have to actually document them it's not enough to have discussed them or have a plan those need to be documented Assessments are still the same. They're required initially in at least every three years, as well as in reaction to significant changes. There are some changes for the risk assessment inputs. So in 6.1.1, we can see that the risk assessment section now includes potentially hazardous processing techniques utilized for electronic equipment processing and other hazardous substances present. So there are some changes there. If that applies to you, you want to take a, clo a closer look at 6.1.1. 6.1.2 specifies some additional items or concepts to be considered through the identification of stewardship aspects, considering meaning you don't necessarily need to include them in the end product the the outputs of that process but you need to consider them and you need to be able to show your auditor that you considered those items so think about how you might want to do that there is documented information required for this section as both evidence of the criteria as an input and the results as an output as well as communication for relevant as relevant um, you'll need to be able to prove that as well through documented information no significant changes to compliance obligations. Materials of concern is a new term in version four and under 6.1.3.1, those are to be treated as hazardous waste. Again, we also see the recent ban amendments and, and Basel Convention changes incorporated into version four, as I mentioned. So 6.1.3.1 also requires the e-stewards organization to adhere to the Basel Convention Article 4A, even if their country has not ratified it. The United States falls into this category and this will be a significant change. 6.1.3.2 is a new section. It includes extended producer responsibility requirements. You'll wanna take a look at the definition for that term to understand if it applies to you. And if so, there are documented information requirements partic for participants in this program that are to be made available upon request. If this doesn't apply to you, you will not need to apply the requirements of this subsection. There is a new clause related to performance verification. That's not a new requirement, but it is new to the body of the standard. So now found within the standard with its, within its own subclause are the requirements for having a documented plan to account for the unannounced performance verification program inspections that e-stewards may conduct with specified inputs for what that plan needs to include. 
The reporting to the eStewards database is also still required and is found in 6.1.4.1. This includes the need for an initial report prior to certification, as well as every subsequent year by January 31st, reporting on the previous year's data. No significant changes regarding objectives. Planning for changes is a new section. If anyone's familiar with um, any of the ISO standards, this would be management of change. So this relates to the planning and implementation of appropriate action regarding significant change to the system. This includes considerations of training, communication needs, monitoring, documentation requirements, things like that. And for anyone who's not familiar with the subject, we're talking about planning for changes before they occur to be proactive instead of reacting to a change that's already been made. 6.4 covers contingency planning. This specifies information to be documented within the plan in the event of facility closure. So this is not new, may contain some slight revisions to the requirements. Again, no significant changes to these requirements in the subclause recover, uh, regarding site closure. Very similar requirements as in version 3.1. 6.4.2, however, removes the option for a corporate parent to hold the financial instrument. This might apply to some of our client organizations. It also provides an exemption from the need for a financial instrument in very specific circumstances. So if the eStewards organization's cleanup or closure costs total less than 5,000 US dollars for which evidence would be required, uh, then the client is not required to maintain a financial instrument. No significant changes regarding insurance, resources, competency, awareness, communication. Internal communication, we see a very clear requirement to ensure there is no fear of reprisal for relevant information such as objectives, operational controls, um, industrial hygiene monitoring results. So the internal communication, need you need to remove any barriers to the effective communication, essentially. And in some cases, one of those barriers is fear of reprisal. People are maybe worried about speaking out, reporting hazards, reporting injuries. Um, maybe they're worried about being fired or suspended or demoted or blocked from a promotion. Um, there are a wide variety of examples where this is seen in the workplace. Um, so as an eSteward certified organization, we'll be looking at how you have worked to remove those barriers. External, external communication requirements, excuse me, are found in 7.4.3. This includes relevant controls, emergency response, security requirements with contractors, visitors, et cetera. There's also specific information that needs to be communicated to the eStewards program administrator and potentially customers. And this is spelled out in 7.4.3. <clears throat> Documented information is shortened again with the removal of the four 15,001 verbiage, but I do want to point out that there are some specific requirements in 7.5.1 for maintaining the documentation. While the organization has a lot of flexibility in how they maintain the documentation requirements found throughout the standard, they can be combined, they can be separated at the client organization's discretion. The ex exceptions to that flexibility are these three specific documents. So these three documents, the closure plan, the emergency preparedness and response plan, and the downstream disposition chart, each need to be maintained as separate individual documents 
separate from each other and separate from the rest of the documented system in order to be easy to find, ac promptly accessed, um, all of those uh, good things. So, so these three documents are specifically called out within the standard to be maintained separately. Other than that, the organization can pick and choose how they maintain the documentation requirements. Control of documented information is similar. There is a requirement to maintain all of the standard requirement records for at least five years. No significant changes regarding operational controls. Uh, the hierarchy of controls is to be utilized where applicable. Without the 14,001 verbiage, these sections are generally shorter. We should see annual drills for relevant types of emergencies. We see the requirement for an industrial hygiene program to address certain types of hazards and prevent hazard migration. Subsection 8.3.1 talks about the potentially hazardous processing technologies. So there are some additional requirements. I've listed out some examples here. We're not going to read through all of this, but these would be added to the general industrial hygiene program requirements in 8.3 if the organization utilizes even one type of PHPT. So take a look at the definition of that, take a look at the tables in the standard to understand if this applies to you. If you're utilizing at least one potentially hazardous processing technology, you have to um, enact these additional industrial hygiene program requirements. 8.4.1 specifies certain topics to be addressed and planned by the organization with documented information as evidence. 8.4.2 requires operational controls for the processing of electronic equipment, including MOCs. We see a table here in the standard table two there are no changes to the content of this table, except that the organization, uh, unless the organization is using closed system technologies for processing. So there are certain items found in table two houses, the items that are restricted from mechanical processing techniques. And then the, again, the only exception to that would be if they're using a, a completely closed system. In general, 8.4.2 is less prescriptive than in version 3.1. However, there are no significant changes to the intent because the intent of the standard hasn't changed. 8.4.3 houses the requirements for uh, packaging, storing, and transporting the electronic equipment under the e-steward organization's control. Some examples include not storing materials of concern for more than one year after receipt. There are some exceptions. Um, there's additional requirements for vehicle and driver safety records for transporters. Some um, carrier criteria, there are stacking limits. Um, these are just a couple examples of some of the changes you can find in 8.4.3. 8.4.4 is a new section that covers tolling Again, take a look at the definition, see if this applies to you, and if so, review 8.4.4 in more detail. Again, the tolling process is regulated within the standard, and you can find that in 8.4.4. Prison operations are not permitted to be utilized unless written approval from the e-stewards program administrator has been obtained and it meets specified criteria in 8.4.5. 8.5 covers the reuse and refurbishment of the electronic equipment. There are no changes to the intent here. <clears throat> it prohibits the sale, transfer, or donation of non-sanitized electronic equipment unless it's going to a NAID AAA certified IDP. The only exceptions to that would be tolling operations or where non-sanitized electronic equipment is sent back to its original owner. Refurb and repair can only be outsourced to IDPs, so it can only go one tier, except when we're talking about ink or toner remanufacturing, which could go one tier further. 
direct reuse electronic equipment must be found fully functional, except shipments to the IDP for refurb and repair. No significant changes to the testing and data sanitization requirements. There are some specified testing requirements such as battery testing criteria. So you will wanna review this section on your own. I'm not saying there are no changes. I'm just saying they're not significant. Um, there are no significant changes to the intent of these requirements. Table three houses exceptions to the full functionality testing requirements such as donations or sales of unusual equipment capped at 1%. Um, and let's see, the one. untested units sold or donated to workers are removed in this version. 8.5.2 includes record identification requirements for each item. So this specifies what that looks like, what needs to be included, but it also houses the, the allowance to simplify those inventory requirements for the qualified smaller components, as I mentioned earlier. So QSCs, take a look at that definition. Those can be put in lots, for example, instead of the need to label or identify each individual unit, which is not always feasible. 8.5.2.1 houses the shipping documentation requirements, specifies the minimum amount of information that needs to be recorded, and it needs to be accessible without the need for unpacking. Appendix A87 houses a declaration that needs to be utilized or an equivalent type of document needs to be utilized for all applicable transboundary shipments. You can find more detail in this section. This section also requires the availability of the identifying information for all shipments other than QSCs, such as itemized packing lists, um, active internet links, there's a variety of ways to meet this requirement, but it is required. 853 is less prescriptive, it's shorter. The only thing I wanna mention here is that the buyer information is not required to be maintained if ev there's evidence that the shipments were tested for full functionality and that they were sold for at least three times the scrap rate. So that might be helpful for some client organizations to maintain that evidence or might be preferable over the buyer information. That's an option in version four. 8.6.1 specifies criteria for MOCs and again references Appendix A. It also requires written proof or justification for meeting specified criteria before utilizing a conditionally allowable option. So if you're thinking about going this route, you'll want to review 8.6.1 in more detail. So those are the conditionally allowable. 8.6.2 focuses on the alternative uses. So this section specifies all of the approval request inclusions and documentation requirements. And written approval is required before using the alternative process. So 8.6.1 requires evidence be gathered and be provided. You're not necessarily waiting for approval, but you are submitting that before using the option. For 8.6.2 with the alternative uses, you are required to have approval before you can go ahead and use that alternative process or processor. So that is a difference between the two. 8.7 covers transboundary movement controls. Again, whole electronic equipment is to be treated as hazardous waste unless the shipment provides documented evidence proving otherwise. Written notification and competent authority consent is required prior to transboundary movement when countries involved are not Basel Convention parties or covered by a relevant multilateral trade agreement. Subsection 8.7.1 includes some exemptions to this requirement, such as new parts, 
or devices purchased under warranty, CRT cullet or glass that has been cleaned and is approved as a feedstock. Those are a couple examples. So there are some exemptions to 8.7 and those can be found in 871. Eight point seven two covers transboundary movements for repair and refurb equipment, and there are labeling and dec declaration requirements. Eight point seven three covers transboundary movements for direct reuse. These need to have an established resale market. That's not necessarily different from version three point one, but there are labeling and declaration requirements for these types of shipments as well. Regarding downstream accountability, there are some additional requirements to reevaluate a downstream processor if there are significant changes. <clears throat> and there is also a note here that this section applies even if the electronic equipment is shipped directly from the customer to the IDP instead of first coming to the eStewards organization because it's still under the organization's control. Uh, it's still relevant for their e-stewards certification. So they're still responsible for that downstream accountability as an e-steward organization, whether they're you know, putting their hands on those materials first or not. No significant changes regarding downstream disposition charts, but there is a change in the standard that an e-steward organization can't utilize a downstream processor in their recycling chain if they were e-steward certified and then lost their e-steward certificate in response to a critical nonconformity. So they can go ahead and start using that downstream processor again if and when the certificate is reinstated. And this will be important when you are verifying the certification status and doing your downstream reviews, your, your downstream due diligence to be on the lookout for this requirement. So if you if you find the certificate is not in good standing and it relates to an instance like this, you'll need to stop using that downstream processor until their status has changed. 8.2 requires supporting documentation for downstream providers and intermediaries within the entire recycling chain, according to all of the subsections that follow. So that's not necessarily new. There might be some changes to the individual requirements in here you'll want to review in more detail. I'm just going through these at a high level so you can see how the standard is structured in version four. We still require initial and annual evaluations. There's still additional verifications if the downstream processor isn't e-steward certified. We see desk audit requirements. We see on-site audit requirements. There are some exceptions to the on-site audit requirements that you can review if you think they apply to you. Certain instances where on-site audits aren't required. The requirements now also include, as I mentioned earlier, review of closure plans and financial surety for these IDPs and the recycling chain that wasn't explicitly required in version 3.1. 8.8.2.4 houses a new requirement to have some type of written contract or agreement or equivalent type of control with specified information found in this section if the IDP is not e-stewards, unless they're a final disposal facility or an end processor in an OECD country. So there are some exceptions here, but the written contract requirement is new. No significant changes to transportation requirements. Regarding records of transfer, we mentioned earlier the five-year requirement for standard-specific records, and there's also a requirement to annually sample the shipments between each IDP and the next non-e-stewards downstream processor. 
8.9 houses data security requirements. It does reference Appendix D for organizations not yet certified to need AAA. After NAID AAA certification is obtained, Appendix D will not be audited anymore because the NAID AAA certification will satisfy all the data security requirements for eStewards version 4. No changes regarding monitoring, sorry, no significant changes regarding monitoring, less prescriptive without that ISO 14000 verbiage in there. <clears throat> Evaluations for compliance are now explicitly required on an annual basis. The frequency was not specified in previous versions. No significant changes regarding facility inspections. Monitoring of electronic equipment is shorter, less prescriptive, but there is a requirement for corrective action if a material balance accounting discrepancy is found to be higher than 5%. So if you're not already instituting corrective action in those cases, you will be required to now. Internal audit requirements are not significantly changed. Management review is not significantly changed, although there are some additional inputs uh, and requirements here that you'll want to adopt. As I mentioned, there are four appendices. I'm going to go through those really quickly as well, just at a high level so you understand what they contain. Appendix A has additional details and criteria for implementing the standard. You'll see references to Appendix A throughout the standard. There's the annual eStewards database reporting, um, the PHPT hazard testing requirements, uh, the transboundary shipment declaration can be found here, just a couple examples. Appendix D has administrative criteria for the eStewards organization. It talks about eligibility for the standard, scope requirements, um, relationships with other sites, logo usage, uh, critical nonconformities issued by eStewards during their performance verification inspections, it talks about the license agreement. One change here is that you're required to get a new license agreement if the organization is purchased or there's a change in ownership. It also requires that the client notify the CB, their certification body, such as PJR, and the eStewards program administrator of significant changes within 15 business days. So it's not appropriate to wait until your audit to bring up those significant changes. They need to be communicated in a, in a timely manner to both the CB and the eStewards administrator. Appendix C covers administrative criteria, but for certification bodies and accreditation bodies. So while these don't directly relate to actions on the, on the end of the requirement, sometimes those requirements trickle down, so it might be worth reviewing. As I mentioned, Appendix C also houses the audit time calculation requirements that PGR will be required to use and clients should expect an increase in audit time accordingly. Appendix D houses the data security criteria until the client obtains NAID AAA certification. Again, that deadline is July 1st, 2022. For any clients pursuing certification for the first time and are not transitioning from version 3.1 to 4.0, very briefly, I just want to go over the registration process. The first step is to obtain a copy of the standard, set up your system documentation to meet the standard requirements, conduct any training required, go ahead and implement those requirements, have your internal audit, have your compliance evaluation, have a management system review, which would include the outputs of the internal audit and compliance evaluation as inputs in that review. You'll need a, uh, you'll need a contract with a certification body, such as PJR, to conduct your audits. And then the registration process consists of two audits, a stage one audit and a stage two audit. We'll talk about those in a second, but after those audits, you'll need to address any non-conformities that result from those audits, if there are any, 
before a certificate could be issued. The registration audit process, again, consists of the stage one and stage two audits. They are different. The stage one is more of a high level overview to make sure you are ready for stage two. The stage two is a full system audit. All the processes would be sampled, all the sites, all the shifts. Um, well, I shouldn't say all the sites, it depends on the scheme, but um, a full system in-depth audit to make sure that the standard requirements have been effectively implemented. Any nonconformities that are issued at stage two need to be resolved before a certificate can be issued. Certificates are good for three years. Once you have your certificate, you enter the surveillance cycle. Two years of surveillance audits could be semi-annual or annual based on your contract and your preference. The third year of that cycle is the recertification audit, which is very similar to the stage two in that it's a full system audit and results in the issuance of a new certificate after any nonconformities are resolved um, to start the three-year cycle all over again. Okay, if you have any questions and haven't gotten to type them yet, please go ahead and do so. But I'm gonna put our contact information up on the screen in the meantime. Again, my name is Austin Matthews. I'm the EHS Assistant Program Manager with PJR. Our EHS Program Manager is Stacy DeSantis. We can both be contacted by email or by calling the main PJR line uh, phone number and put through to our individual extensions. If you're a new client looking for a quote, I've also included the sales department information here. So let's see if we have any questions. I don't see any questions. I'll hang out for another minute in case anyone is typing. But if not, again, a copy of the slides can be downloaded from PGR's website, as well as a recording of today's webinar will be available soon. Please reach out via email or phone if you have any questions. eStewards is also a good re uh, resource if you have technical questions about the interpretation of standard requirements. Um, we can be... Um, we can help as much as we can, but we have to make sure we're not consulting. So if it's a if it's a question of interpretation of the standard, eStewards may be a better resource. Again, if you haven't already scheduled your transition audit, please do so, um, so that we can make sure you transition without a lapse in certification. I still don't see any questions, so I'm going to sign off. Thank you for joining me today as we talked about eStewards version four. Good luck with your transition if you have your transition audit scheduled and coming up. And if you haven't already done so, please go ahead and schedule that transition with your scheduler with PJR. Thank you and have a great day.